the record store. The record store was the lifeline for the North American jungle and drum and bass scene. Breakbeat Science opened up uh, like two blocks away from where I live. So I was there like every day. That was our hub of, uh, you know, our community could meet, hear the new stuff, buy new records, uh, trade mixes. Uh, it was kind of like our, our meetup spot before there was really an internet to do that. Breakbeat Science was the first drum and bass store in America and I feel like that really helped New York become a mecca of drum and bass for the world and definitely for the whole country because at first it was the only one, it was the only place of its kind. At the record store, music enthusiasts were able to share the love for new music. And it had its own culture like based around that shop and everyone would come in and talk to each other and catch up and fight over promos and like that was a culture that I think could never be duplicated by the internet. Darren and I became really good mates and we, I was involved with a record shop called Temple Records which was underneath Liquid Sky. Darren worked there as well and we noticed we were selling more and more jungle and Darren and I personally were getting less and less interested in techno and trance and house. So it felt like, why don't we see if we could do an all jungle shop? Roll around 95, we launched Breakbeat Science, which was the first jungle shop in America. DJs were able to connect directly with the UK sound by buying one of the few copies that made it to the record stores in their city. I started working in a record store that had just opened there called Subtopia. The imported jungle and drum and bass records that came through often were white labels, and record stores limited their ordering to a few copies. That was my first experience working at a record store where I was in a position where I could not only get a hold of all the new jungle and drum and bass stuff, you know, because at the time it was really starting to become apparent that this was a sound I was into. I would also buy my records from Breakbeat Science. And, uh, and I used to love Breakbeat Science because they would have really great exclusives um, that I couldn't get at Satellite because we had different distribution deals. The fact that DJ couldn't just download a song or an artist couldn't put out unlimited copies of a song inspired the exclusivity and keep it underground mentality that is associated with the junglist culture. You couldn't just go to a, a record store and get whatever you wanted. Uh, so I ended up convincing a local record shop to let me start ordering through a distributor that I'd gotten the phone number from on uh, a record that a friend had. And uh, I kind of went from there and I started bringing in the records for myself and then my friends wanted them. So I started ordering records for the record shop and, um, and the scene kind of helped develop from there because of course we needed the music to have a scene around it. The record store was a place to meet and connect with those who heard the call of jungle. You just go to the record store, you grab a stack, and zoom through it with a needle and a turntable. Today, without record stores playing a major role as sort of a social club to cater to underground music, drum and bass and the music industry is at a whole new point. Only love will do. We're, we're attracted to what's familiar to us, and vinyl to me is something that I train myself with. There's definitely a lot of cool capabilities that you know people can do, DJs can do now with, with uh, mixing digitally, but I miss the vinyl. It's hard to get classics because who's selling the classic? Everyone wants to buy the classics. The ability to play digital tracks, you know, and have a whole digital library in Serato, it just gives DJs more to do, and so therefore the dependence on vinyl is not really there. So, I mean, it's just like evolution of music, you know. Now we mix off of our computers. I mean, not all of us, or with CDJ, you know. And it's great because I can cue so quick. Like I can be like, oh, next song, and I can have the next song cued and almost beat matched like four, eight bars in. MP3 and internet technologies have changed the music industry in the way we buy music, hear music, and enjoy music in live settings. But it hasn't changed the diehard junglist's opinion. Since the inception of Jungle took place in analog times and evolved with the digital age, it holds a very special marker in the timeline of music as a whole, and in turn, a different set of values for the already in place, junglist culture. 
These values include the act of showcasing true mixing skill, scratches that are on time, and a freestyle attitude laid out by an MC. Every time you go to lay down a piece of vinyl and you mix it, it's easier, I think, than using a CDJ. It's just, it's physical. Vinyl's great, it sounds great, but like, at the end of the day, it's all about the music. Across every ocean and to every corner of the world, Jungle and Drum and Bass brought a new sound formulated by and for the urban streets. I think most of the U.S. growth has been owed to different people in different time frames, honestly. Like, I mean, from a DJ standpoint, from the early years, I mean, I would give Diesel Boy and AK and, and Dara and even like DB and Soul Slinger back in the day, you know, like those guys were all in the press pushing really hard, working really hard to get the sound and just to get the just to get the name out there. The scene in America was kind of like was like a pretty much a grassroots effort from all these small scenes and because this network got set up, DJs would come come from overseas and tour around and just help build up all the scenes together. On the East Coast there were three or four epicenters that really kind of you know that really help the music grow. New York was definitely one of them, and it was the one where I was, so it's the one that I know the most about. Then you also had Boston, DC, Baltimore, were also a very, very integral, Philadelphia. It's kind of cool where, with this resurgence of jungle drum and bass right now, a lot of old school cats are coming out of the woodwork, and we need that. We need some of the experience and, and some of the history and roots. I think, even though like uh, the scenes sometimes anywhere might not seem as huge, the people that are there are real passionate. Jungle and drum and bass invaded the shores of North America as it quickly gained notoriety and changed the face of electronic music forever. And I brought over mixtapes with me. I, I brought over mixtapes with me and I was like, because I missed that music so much. So I brought my mixtapes with me. Um, I met um, DJ R.A.W. I'm curious. And I was like, you guys got to listen to this. Uh, and it was just a freak meeting of those guys. And I let them listen to it. And they were already playing that kind of music. They had like the fledgling sound from England. Don't know where they got it, but they were playing it. And I was like, well, I MC a bit. So, and that's how I first kicked it off. Throughout the 90s, the evolution of a cultural scene and music had begun. We've always sort of in Toronto heavily drawn on UK influences. And not just in not just in jungle music, drum and bass, in, in all styles of music. So in a sense, we've, we sort of modeled ourselves after the UK scene. In the mid 90s, Marcus Visionary, Mystical Influence, and Sniper were releasing records with established UK labels out of Canada. They were also responsible for some of North America and Toronto's first drum and bass record labels. These artists were instrumental in flooding Toronto with UK DB talent at that time. Probably 92, 93 would sort of be the beginnings of it in Toronto. Recognized as one of the strongest scenes outside of the UK continuously now. Some of these rave companies would specialize in different styles of music. So Pleasure Force, jungle wasn't their focus, but they still would have some jungle DJ. And then another company was called Delirium, which um, I don't know his exact involvement in it, but Marcus Visionary had something to do with that. A company that did focus on jungle was a company called Cyrus. Uh, but at the same time, while they focused on jungle, they'd also have house and techno DJs in other room. A Canadian production company called Cyrus began putting jungle and drum and bass on the main stage with proper sound systems to highlight the full frequency sound that DB has to offer. Cyrus was the, the big promotion company up there that did these, like, I mean, back then they were huge, and the main room was drum and bass for them, like Jungle. Like, they'd have, they'd have Kenny Ken as their headliner while everybody else in the world was trying to get Sasha and Digweed as their headliner. This opened up the sound to a much wider audience in Canada in the 90s. This guy, Rob Lisi, I think his name was, and the whole Cyrus um, thing, he must have been about 17. The original parties I was doing in Toronto, I think they were illegal initially, you know, like they were in some disused warehouse, you know, but they went from literally, I don't know, a weird place that maybe have like 900 people to within two, three years to where you got 8,000 and they would have this massive warehouse where they'd put a curtain down the middle and Sneak's doing the house room and we're doing the jungle. It'd be like literally 8,000 people in each room. You know, it was incredible. 
and I still couldn't absorb. At one point, it was like that's there was bigger parties there than that were in the UK. Every night of the week, there was something. We had our uh, fungal junk Tuesdays. Uh, you know, we had Fridays at Turbo. We had Wednesdays at System Sound Bar. Like there was Magic Mondays even. Like that was that's going way back. Magic Mondays was was the spot. Vinyl Syndicate guys in, in Toronto, um, Sniper and Mystical, you had Marcus Visionary, uh, all these guys were doing big things in it and it kind of showed to me anyway that it was possible to, to accomplish something as a Canadian drum and bass artist. As Toronto was kicking off its jungle scene, the music spread down at the speed of sound into the United States. Through a handful of North American artists and promoters, the U.S. and Canadian junglist scenes started to develop. With the help of avid enthusiasts, the number of individuals with a taste for jungle and drum and bass grew. Quickly, people from all areas and all walks of life began showing an interest in supporting this new musical genre. We've been chasing the UK scene for, for years. We book UK DJs and people are chasing this UK scene. And I think what will make the American scene stronger is when people realize there are talented producers here in America, like Random Movement, like Sinistar, like Flocko. The two main coastal cities, Los Angeles and New York City, provided a flourishing scene through the 90s. DB and Scotto were the ones that brought the drum and bass because with NASA, that was like the first breakbeat club in America and it was before the music split. DB, Dara, Odie, and a consistent OG selection of artists across the five boroughs were persistent in keeping this then brand new sound alive in NYC. Odie was probably the one that really put me onto yeah, so many yeah, tunes yeah, from back yeah. in the day. Big shouts to Mac because this guy does not quit. New York City had a lot to offer. Concrete Jungle, Jungle Sky, and NASA started the jungle vibes there, and the club scene embraced the music. In America, when we started it, the only place you could really hear it was in raves, but there were no, no real club scene where people could go have a drink and listen to the music. And we saw that vacuum and we thought maybe we could get something going with it. It doesn't matter if there's like two people there or 200 people there, like you know that next Monday night, yeah, there's, there's gonna be a concrete yeah, jungle. Really okay, the beginning, three DJs have started, so everybody knows. Cassin, Delmar, and Panic. On the first flyer, those are the first three DJs. After that, a lot of people became involved pretty quickly. Odie, Dara, Soul Slinger, but those are the three original DJs. The American four elements of hip hop blended with the culture. I feel, and I think it's established that like DJing and, and you know, uh, stuff like, you know, hip hop and DJing that kind of go hand in hand kind of started in New York City. In the 90s, at the same time, the West Coast had also embraced DMB. During the 90s, everything started in LA. The jungle scene started with Belmont Tunnel Party Jungle. It was young and small and, and underground, really underground. Some of the first people in LA to represent were Gary W, Curious, the Jungle Whisper Platoon. Los Angeles hip hop and rave DJs were integrating this new, sped up, breakbeat style into DJ sets, and they were beginning to establish their own style of jungle and drum and bass. I was one of the first DJs that was bringing Jungle uh, on a weekly basis to Los Angeles. So we pretty much uh, did the blueprint for the scene, not even knowing what we're doing, just doing what we love, doing this night with like hardcore breakbeat techno, ragga jungle music. As for Jungle, it was it was really me, Oscar the Grouch, DJ Curious, DJ Trance, and Jason Blakemore. Insomniac really helped out, you know, Pasquale and Forrest and them doing the, the bass rush parties. That did it. I mean, that that set a huge foundation. Bass Rush through Insomniac has been a lot of the massive sides we're bringing in out of the country talent, you know, from the UK and just throwing massive lineups. All the EDCs, all the Bass Rush parties, they're booking major drum bass lineups. You know, they're still championing for them. I don't know, it seemed like it just picked up really fast because there wasn't a lot of people doing it back then. You know, I mean, like you had like our crew, but there was like kind of like the the really tight circle of LA DJs like Raul, RW, um, Curious, Oscar the Grouch, who was like, you know, a good friend of ours and, and one of the original heads that we really looked up to even from like the techno years to the, to the jungle years. Eventually Machete came through and yeah, and so that was kind of like the, 
early beginnings. Then you had a lot of people coming along like, uh, you know, Hayes and Alder, Origin, uh, Fear. Kind of, I came up in that same sort of, you know, generation, Scuba. He Sassen made his name, you know, really big in the U.S. production tip, and Deacon, and, you know, throw a machete in the mix, and it seemed like that was the lineup for every party for, for a couple of years. For the rest of the country, at this time, pirate radio stations and record stores played a major role in spreading the sound across the vast continent of North America. I used to record a, a radio show, an experimental radio show in Canada called Brave New Waves. It was on CBC. It was on in the middle of the night, and I would uh, tape it and then listen to it on my Walkman on the bus on the way to school. I would go home to England every couple of weeks and bring back tunes or bring back more mixtapes and get more involved and go to raves and all that stuff. So. Mixtapes of jungle and drum and bass were quickly available at North American record stores and throughout the techno, rave, and hip-hop scenes. The jungle sound began to spread across the continent. This predominantly came via the UK mixtapes into Toronto, New York City, and Los Angeles areas. Respect Drum and Bass in LA came into play and has been a weekly DB night for over 15 years and continues to this day. Hosted by the crew, Junglist Platoon, it is a true testament to the timeless appeal of jungle and drum and bass in North America. Junglist Platoon started in 1994. The name was coined by uh, Scuba. It was just more of a representation of our collection of friends at the time. Now it's kind of more represented by the DJs that are the residents that respect right now. Respect has been the blueprint for other cities striving to provide a solid local weekly. San Diego has always been on the heels of the LA drum and bass scene. Tez and Quest broke into the rave scene and started smashing people with this new sound. Crews like Deep, Pinwheel Cartel, and SD Union have always strived to keep the D&B vibe alive. In San Francisco, Funkatec and Violence recordings have pushed the sound from the beginning. San Francisco was the hub. San Francisco was huge, you know, in the early days and like the mid 90s. The key dudes when I came out here was like Hive, Gridlock, Juju, Futuro was still going on. We've been doing a, a weekly as well the last couple years called Stamina Sundays. In San Francisco I witnessed a lot of great things that happened. One of them was the formation of the Violence Crew and then putting out hit singles and you know putting SF on the map. Close neighbors Sacramento had 916 Junglist. They have been persistent in providing great atmosphere for underground drum and bass events. Seattle has Onset and Soma. They keep the Northwest U.S. supplied with D&B vibes along with other crews in the area that range from Portland to Vancouver. Seattle kind of benefited from having a lot of these guys come over to L.A. and brought them up to Seattle. A lot of the old school U.K. guys uh, that were coming to these parties because of the 360 BPM crew. The East Coast is riddled with jungle scenes everywhere. I think on the East Coast, um, we definitely give a shout out to the NASA crew, like DB and Jason Jinx. Concrete Jungle was key for many of these cities learning about the drum and bass sound. Boston has Elements, an all drum and bass weekly that's been pushing the sound for over 14 years. Philly artists, including Gasm Records, were pushing some of the earliest stateside smashers. The music and culture started to spread to every corner of North America. By the late 90s, junglists were supporting and helping grow this new sound and wanting to share the junglist experience to new uninformed music enthusiasts. Kevin Gimble founded Circle Management, an agency that has grown with bass culture's popularity. Kevin helps provide top-notch national and international artist tours in North America. He gravitated towards the hard stuff. You know, maybe it was because Trace was living in Philly at the time. Trace's influence was big, you know, and it's like, you know, Trace being the, the godfather of tech steps, so to speak, you know, by him bringing Ed Rush around, or him bringing Nico around, everyone. And it's just, next thing you know, Philly was the tech step capital of a he started Circle in Philadelphia and has moved office to Los Angeles to increase their foothold for artist management with bass music talent. Dieselboy has always been relentless in keeping D&B alive. 
His skills behind the decks were pivotal in introducing a wider audience to the music. My first opportunity I had was to become a resident DJ at a club called Metropole in Pittsburgh. We'd have some Sunday night 1,600 people on a Sunday, which back then was unbelievable. I became affiliated with a night called Steel City Jungle in Pittsburgh. It was a drum and bass weekly that we did for a few years. After that, it was Planet of the Drum. Planet of the Drums has been a staple for quality drum and bass. Which is myself, AK-1200, Dara, and Messinian. The act has consistently filled auditoriums nationwide for years. Nobody in the past 10 years brought it like Planet of the Drums. Um, they would sell out every single time. They have been one of the most influential acts in North America and brought the sound to even the smallest, most isolated scenes in the country. Two tough productions, based in Washington, D.C., our nation's capital, kept the early days of their jungle scene stocked with a rotation of big-name DMB acts. I think uh, one of the ones at the beginning was when we hosted Groove Rider in North America for the first time. That was... Yeah, 1995, Groove Rider's actually U.S. debut. He played Toronto before. And then the next year, uh, Ed Rush's U.S. debut. We got some early support from LTJ Bookham and uh, Conrad. Uh, back in 96. Since then, you know, we've continued the relationships with these guys and um, continue to do drone based events in and around DC. Chicago artists Danny the Wild Child, Stunna, and Phantom 45 were traveling the country playing jungle and drum and bass even before the music was fully established and still are DB loyalist DJs. It all goes back to the brave days as well too because I mean I was a DJ already but I was a high school DJ playing hip hop and doing high school dances and whatnot but I started going to raves and uh, I just blew my mind to see if the DJ was the god and the music he was playing was just something different because it was underground and everybody there was dancing towards the DJ. Danny the Wild Child probably the most influential. Phantom 45 those guys are basically the two of the original drum and bass junglists in Chicago. I just had the Phantom 45 moniker, ran with that, and just started doing as many shows as I could. Played a lot of, you know, around the Midwest, uh, Milwaukee, Ohio, you know, all around there. Started playing every weekend, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday most times. And, you know, basically just pushing the music out there for the people. MIA has been militant in providing junglists with quality events. Here in Chicago, we were just like, you know what, we're not gonna do what everybody else is doing. We're gonna do what we wanna do. Eventually, somehow, some way, we're gonna find all the people who like what we do. The way, you know, jungle and drum and bass is attuned to, you need extra subs, you need extra, extra bass. They bring it in with them to make sure that it's gonna sound good. Like Concrete Jungle, MIA has expanded their crew across the country to different cities wanting to carry the brand. The Midwest has always looked to Chicago for the freshest in underground music. The Chicago scene helped flourish and inspire promoters, DJs, and producers throughout the Midwest in cities like Milwaukee, Minneapolis, Kansas City, St. Louis, and Cincinnati to keep pushing their scene locally. Hailing out of Milwaukee, Keen lays a very heavy vibe on a dark side of DB. In the middle of the country, Denver started their scene as a point in between the major coastal cities that acts could also line up gigs on their way to Los Angeles or New York City. Reload Productions was a main reason for Denver's early DB exposure. We started doing the weekly over at Snake Pit, and it was uh, me and Echo. So we ended up, you know, taking over a night that some other guys had started actually, and uh, just got this weekly running somehow based on doing it for really cheap and just making it really accessible for people to come out and it really caught on quickly, you know, and the next thing you know, it was like seven and a half, eight years straight we were running with that. Reload continues booking the top UK talent and helped establish a well-educated junglist community in Denver. Recon DAB, One Productions, and Sonus Productions are also a few of Denver's based crews. The Florida scene has WMC, or Winter Music Conference, hitting South Beach every March. This brings events such as Stank Love, Ram, Smog, Future Sound of Breaks, Hospitality, and the World of Drum and Bass as an annual heavy fix for many drum and bass heads. Crews like United DB regularly push to keep DB going into Miami's trend inspired nightlife. Out of Orlando, 
Outcomes AK-1200. We started really booking a lot of people from England and stuff like that, and, and there were a lot of really big shows, and, and the club scene got huge early on in the 90s. One of the first figures from North America to release D&B records in the UK, he is also part of the infamous Planet of the Drums. Torque DMB is a promotion crew also responsible for countless events to the central Florida area. Texas shows us unity with crews working together to bring acts all over the state. In Austin, Everyday Junglist has been influential in providing internet radio, forums, and all things junglist to the people. In Dallas, Battletech was established in 1997 and since has been providing local events. DJ Titan has constantly worked hard to bring the jungle sound to Dallas venues such as the Lizard Lounge. Large crews like Two Tone utilize the help of many junglers to bring the major DMB talent and keep local nights rolling too. Houston has been in the jungle scene since the early days. Established in 1995, Pern Lion started as one of the first US-based jungle fanzines. They continue bringing the sound at Frenzy, a D&B monthly. From the heart of the Deep South, we have Evil Intent, consisting of three artists, Nick, Gigantor, and Treasure Fingers. Gigantor and myself, we were living in Alabama, of all places. Uh, deep rural south and um, we were just doing our thing and we started Evil Intent recordings there and that was before Evil Intent was actually Evil Intent it was just a label at the time it was myself and Nick and Gigantor he was like playing in punk bands and stuff and I was playing rock bands and stuff as well you know we kind of fell into doing dance music I noticed he started DJing just under the name Nick and then uh, sat there in the studio one day and was we're like hey let's you know let's bash out a tune like you know i've got a bunch of gear here we could figure something out and it's kind of how we started we just started with that and um i think regionally we picked up steam you know what i mean and so we kind of made a name for ourselves in our region and then from there we just kept building and building and i think the the moment where it all kind of started to take off for us was when uh, renegade hardware and barcode took an interest in us the sound has branched out across North America and found fans and made creators who produce the sound in places seemingly remote to the urban beginnings of the genre. In Oklahoma, a major contributor to the trance and bass sound emerged. Subsonic brings a heavy UK sound straight out of the heartland. Almost every major city in North America has a grassroots established scene ready and devoted to pushing the junglist culture and music. As the vibe and music spreads, it recruits new, hungry junglist soldiers ready for an energetic sound and environment not contaminated by mainstream music and entertainment to party in. The internet has opened new doors for independent North American DMB producers and labels to get their sound to the masses. Social technology and travel over the years has linked many of North American junglist communities together and helped spread the knowledge to junglists. DNB websites provide a platform for North American artists to reach a wider audience and have access to the latest tunes anywhere, instantly. Internet radio plays a huge part in providing the freshest jungle and drum and bass available. Stateside stations like DMB Radio and Bass Drive continue to offer live radio 24-7 and even provide live shows with North American artists. Online city-based forums specializing in jungle and drum and bass are more and more common, allowing easy access to information about events locally and nationally. The jungle and drum and bass scenes in America continue to develop with promoters and underground support that is unparalleled. The information age has made these individual scenes more united when they were once spread apart too far across the North American continent to communicate. And as the information is digested and the live, on the fly jungle and drum and bass experience is appreciated, the sky is the limit for this diverse and still futuristic music. The junglist culture 
It is a community filled with people that share common love, energy, and vibe. Made up of individuals that are from all walks of life, as unique as the culture we are part of. From the time they find the beat, bass, and unity from the junglist community, they begin opening up a new part of their hearts and minds. There is the inevitable bond, the music, the culture, the jungle sound. A community built by individuals to cater to a culture that is not contaminated by the barrage of pop culture or mainstream media. People spread apart over the vast landmass of the Americas. People that, through knowledge and the experience of the energy of jungle and drum and bass events, have come together. Jungleists in North America that surpassed international and state borders and found their own sonic paradise through drum and bass music and jungle culture. We call this the American Jungle. was a regular vibe So many spoke of being inside Torn from the matrix to break the cycle Life was hard fought just to take the ride War paid with lies, friends stuck to genres Never get high boxed in, that was our mantra Remarkable, solitude met community Individuals embrace the fight Become accepted, from a resistance Be empathetic, but never dismiss The fact we were united by failure Never forget this But it was fabricated A lie We use it as a tool to inspire Cause honestly it's really based on a timeline Designed to be as long as we desire This is America Faith is a sword of toxic Either use it or get used by it Those are your options Believe in the cost we spent So many years just trying to prevent That it's not In the American jungle You can find the heart of a soldier Fight in the battle of the humble of a culture you see in the American jungle so you can hear the pain and I won't cry until so we see the barriers crumble we will see the stars and the stripes turn black and white fight in the American jungle so you can find the heart of a soldier fight in the battle of the humble with only the beliefs of a culture you see in the American jungle
This is a 24-7, 365 grind. If you're passionate about it and you really want to build a culture and you really want to make a mark in this, blood, sweat, tears, sleepless nights.